Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, thanks ever so much for joining this webinar, in which we're going to explore VMware alternative for, for cloud providers. Um, we've had a huge interest for this webinar um, across all geographies. So I'm really pleased to welcome everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time out to actually uh, see this. Now, um, as I said, we're going to be talking about a VMware alternative from Virtuoso. So I represent Virtuoso along with my colleague, uh, Alice. So I've got the privilege of uh, being the director of the sales engineering team here. And uh, Alice, great to have you with me. Uh, thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you very much for having uh, you all here. So great to see you here. Thanks, Alice. So there's a, an agenda you can see on the screen, uh, everyone. Um, so we're going to be talking about an alternative that we have here at Virtuoso. And ever since um, Broadcom made their announcement, we've had um, uh, countless conversations with customers interested in what we can offer um, to support their, their workloads. And this is where it gets really interesting for us because we've been in this market for quite some time, over 20 years supporting virtualization, containerization of workloads. This webinar is to share with you some information about Virtuoso and what we have as a part of our OpenStack-based platform that delivers true multi-tenancy, true service operations, and we'll then go into a live demo. So we're going to talk about what we can offer as an interesting alternative. And we're going to show you this as a live demo. So myself and Alice are praying uh, that everything will actually, you know, work work well for us as we go through this. Uh, let's go forwards. I mentioned Broadcom and Broadcom, um, with their decision in terms of how they're operating with VMware, has shaken up the market like we've never seen before. It's been quite unprecedented, the kind of changes which are being um, imposed, forced, spread throughout the IT world. Um, you can see there's a quote on this uh, page about, right, 20% of uh, VMware enterprise customers will move away from VMware stack. We're having conversations that we have done last year and now, and if anything, those um, conversations are accelerating significantly with organizations looking for an alternative, looking for options. What else is out there? What could, what could they potentially um, use? So, this for us is you know, a really interesting time. And you know, in all truth, we've, it seems like we've never been busier because of the amount of activity within the industry right now. So um, OpenStack is a very clear alternative. It's been around for a large many years and it can be viewed as a real interesting and um, you know, option for everybody. It promises a lot of things, a lot of value, more flexibility, a huge range of services, you can customize it however you need. Um, it's very cost efficient and it comes from the open source world. Um, there's no real vendor lock-in. Yes, you can get certain flavors of OpenStack, but by and large, the constructs within the OpenStack um, um, elements here are pretty much vendor agnostic. And there's a huge degree of community support and information available around this. So you may well think that OpenStack, well, that's the obvious choice potentially. But is it actually suitable for you? Is it suitable for um, your organization and helping your business move forwards? And a lot of times um, people will think and are thinking, well, you know, I need easy deployment. I need rapid time to market. I don't want to be too concerned about the management overhead. So it needs to be easy to manage and administer and, and ultimately a low TCO. And these are some specific points that as a service provider or a data center operations owner manager, you've got to think about these things. What kind of custom support or SLA arrangements could I put in place? using such a system. What about hardware compatibility? Have I got to rewrite all of my internal training and documentation? How do I integrate all of these OpenStack services? For anybody that's used OpenStack, you'll know that it's got a modular system, sort of like um, Lego bricks, building blocks, that you build all these uh, services together to you know, deliver an outcome. So there's a lot of considerations when we think about um, running with you know OpenStack. There's 
you know, the reality is perhaps a little bit different to, to what we hear about, first of all. Um, it can be complex. It can be time consuming uh, because this can be quite a different departure to what people have uh, been used to uh, operating previously. And actually, OpenStack can require a certain, a certain skill and certain type of engineer needed to actually um, administer it, manage it, tune it, and so on and so forth. We use the phrase, OpenStack is great, it's free to download, but it can be expensive to run. So OpenStack could be an answer, but mm, it might not be depending on what your business needs to do. Now, um, there's two quotes here from two uh, CSPs, cloud service providers. So these are large enterprises who are virtuoso customers. And one of the key things, you can see the theme here, is that OpenStack is the obvious solution, but I want to spend more time running my business, not on developing and building the platform ourselves. And that is a common theme we're hearing from a lot of the service providers that have looked at OpenStack and said, yeah, it looks great. It seems to deliver what we want, but I don't want to go to all of the effort of building that out, having to manage, having to maintain, and all of those points that I mentioned previously. So where Virtuoso have come in is we've actually done the hard work for you. We use OpenStack, but we encapsulate that with a lot of other layers of software as well. Essentially, it's an out-of-the-box cloud platform that supports and enables your virtualized workloads. So we support virtualization, virtual machines, and Kubernetes, and storage, storage provisioning. We have orchestration within this platform, we support networking from a software-defined networking point of view, and we wrap it up in an easy-to-access user interface. Anybody that's used OpenStack before, you don't need to know OpenStack to use our platform. In fact, it probably is not recognizable if you're familiar with OpenStack when you use ours, because we've built the whole front-end, the whole UI, to make it easy to access and easy to administer. We have automated install processes and zero downtimes zero downtime updates. And what that means is we actually build out a hyper-converged architecture, which we'll get onto shortly, and we perform what we call rolling updates, where we will move the virtual instances around, update one particular host at a time, and then ripple that through the entire structure that we have. The net net of that is that it gives you continuous operation. We have been in the market for over 20 years, and we spent a lot of time tuning and improving the efficiency of the underlying software, the underlying operating system KVM elements as well. So we've got a large um, heritage in, in doing this. And as a result, we've got a hugely experienced engineering team, very okay with OpenStack. As I say, you do not need to know OpenStack to use our platform. And we offer that full commercial support for all of this, for all of this delivery. One of the questions I've been asked recently, over the last sort of few months in particular, from organizations looking to move workloads from, from where they are, from, from VMware, is I want to move to a, an environment platform that's fully supported. And we do have that. We've got a very large support organization naturally offering follow some 24 7 support. Now, we wanted to draw this parallel because we get asked a lot. And some of the questions that you've sent in are all about do you have the same as you know, XYZ from VMware? Do you have the same as this? Is it a true replacement? Look, I use the word alternative. We're very, very careful about this. We offer an alternative and we offer key functionality that, yes, it can map onto VMware products. Do we have absolutely everything that VMware offers? No, we don't. We are an alternative to help run and support your virtualized workloads. So this is how we actually, if you like, collapse all of these different product capabilities from the VMware side into one. This is virtuoso hybrid infrastructure, and this is a platform which you're going to see shortly. And from a cloud director perspective, we offer a standard out of the box multi tenanted management support uh, with self service capability. From uh, a virtualization from a hypervisor perspective, ours is KVM based. From an NSX or a, um, software based networking, we offer a software defined networking layer. Within, within our offering, um, in terms of chargeback accounting, billing, and so on, we have metering and reporting tools enabled within. And then for some of those organizations that may be familiar with vSAN, well, actually, we do have a software-defined engine. Um, and we describe it as a hyper-converged play anyway.
So we've collapsed all those different sort of products on the left-hand side, and we deliver a turnkey solution on the right through what we call virtuoso hybrid infrastructure. Now, I'm going to get into the technical side of this just a little bit more uh, to explain the architecture, because what we found when we have conversations with clients, with customers that are used to using VMware, is that we need to help them understand what this transition is, what this journey is. Um, ours is um, a system built upon a number of services which are all orchestrated at the back end using OpenStack. But we present this out as an easy to use and consume service. And this can include Kubernetes as a service, load balancer, VPN as a service, storage as a service, and so on. You can use all of these or just one of these if you wish it's not a problem at all but the whole point is that it's built upon a hardened platform under the covers as well now let's just draw a comparison from the vmware perspective um i'm going to just unfold here a really simple but perhaps a typical vmware architecture which you may be using and hopefully everybody's familiar with this probably most of us on this call have been used to deploying vmware um, in some shape or form so here we've got some servers with a virtualization there, so the, you know, basically a software, we might connect them to a backend storage array, okay? Uh, and then at the front end, as it were, we basically run our virtual machines, which are hosting and supporting our applications. So it's fairly simple and it's a fairly standard construct. There was one question uh, about uh, VMware Essentials. And essential to me, when I've, when I've used this in the past, this started with a three server or three host cluster, which is really what you're seeing here on the screen. Now, to translate this, to transition this to virtuoso hybrid infrastructure, we focus on the servers. And in this diagram now on the screen, I've got a cluster of a number of servers. And the key thing with these servers is that they're interconnected over a common network, no surprise there, and we also expect the servers to have a number of disks within them. Not many, just some internal storage. So we start with the physical nodes, okay, with some internal storage, and then we connect these servers, VMware hosts, if you will. Um, we call them nodes. There's always, you know, change of language here. Um, but we connect them over a, a high-speed network. Uh, 10 gig, 25 gig is preferred or higher. Now, we can support RDMA. RDMA is used for a storage network only. We have two networks. Um, that we define here. One is effectively for all the storage traffic, all the I.O., and the other network is basically for everything else. Now, we take these, these uh, nodes or these servers and we layer software on them. So the virtuoso hybrid infrastructure software is deployed on all of these nodes. And in doing so, we form a cluster. We say the minimum really needs to be five nodes for production operation. There's no upper limit. You can scale this system, you can scale a, clus a cluster to however many nodes you wish. The reason we say five nodes is because we deploy a number of services in a redundant HA fashion across all of the servers, all of the nodes within a deployment. And in doing so, we deliver full HA. Now, can our software be stored on a single server? Yes, it can, but there's no resilience in that. So we don't support that for production operation. So we say five nodes is a starting position for production operations. Okay, so we deploy our software. Now you'll see some software defined layers there, software defined compute, software defined storage, software defined network. I'm just gonna explore the software defined networking uh, at this point. Now, this is probably as technical as this session goes, but there's a number of key services that we deliver as a part of our software defined networking stack. And this is everything that we basically need to support multiple virtual networks within the platform. And when I get onto the next slide, you'll see what that means in terms of providing, if you will, what we call multiple virtual data centers. So we can provide isolation between users of the platform as needed. The schematic on the right hand side just shows you the connection between the virtual elements and the physical elements as well. So all of the core networking elements that you would expect, I'll suggest, if you're coming from an NSX background or a general networking background, you're all there, IPv4, IP6 supported, we use distributed switching, routing, virtual routing, we have inbuilt, DHCP and IPAM, and a number of those services 
which obviously relate to how the network is configured. Now, let's wind this back and let's talk about, okay, well, I've got my virtual, excuse me, virtual hybrid infrastructure um, cluster here. How do I go about administering it? We have a cluster-wide administration user interface, which you'll see in a moment. And using that, we use that to manage the cluster. And we can manage that and we can create multiple, I use the phrase virtual data center, it's a tenant. We basically can allocate a certain amount of resource, a CPU, RAM, storage, and then we connect it with the network, give it a network, and those tenants can then support virtual machines and also Kubernetes clusters. So they're simply consuming the resource, but they are completely isolated from each other. So this is the model we talk about a lot with service providers. Okay. Um, if you are an enterprise that actually service provider model doesn't actually mean anything to you, you can have this as a completely virtualized platform to support your virtual machines, your Kubernetes workloads. That's absolutely fine. You don't have to use all these tenants. But what you might want to think about and what a lot of enterprises who use Virtuoso software do is that they turn this tenant into a business unit. So you're, um, if you like, portioning part of your cluster resource for one business unit or one team or another team completely flexible, it's completely down to yourself how you operate it. But we use the phrase tenant, multi-tenanted, of course, and each tenant is able to create and manage virtual instances, so VMs or Kubernetes clusters themselves, using the resources that's been assigned. Over and above that, VHI software also enables storage as a service, so we've got S3 as a service uh, enablement, and also, iSCSI and NFS presentations. If you know from the very first screen of the architecture where I talked about a VMware cluster having its shared storage back end, we're not saying you've got to throw those away. We can attach those to a VHI cluster, but must bear in mind that it's built and designed upon using storage internally to the nodes as well. So we always need that. Okay. I've covered a lot of ground there, I believe, <laughs> and I hope that all makes sense. Now, as we go forwards into the demo section, you'll actually see a lot of this theory put into practice. And a lot of uh, what I've talked about now, it's important to understand the different layers because as organizations go through a transition from using um, something such as VMware to Virtuoso, we want to make sure that we understand what that transition is. And we're going to come on to some of the additional services like training and education later on. So with that, I'm going to invite Aliche to step up to deliver a demo. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then pass uh, the baton to Aliche. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much. Um... I hope that, uh, and I, I'm seeing that you also started in asking a lot of questions. So it's, it's very good that you can follow the session and we can uh, have so much interest from, from the community. What I would like to start with is uh, with the end user portal. This is absolutely uh, one of, of the best things that we have uh, for the multi-tenancy. It is very important to have multi-tenancy with fully isolated tenants where uh, the customers can just uh, log in and start consuming services because our platform is enabling you just to uh, go into production and having your customer consuming your services. Um, once that your uh, end user is using the end user portal, you have the full experience of uh, simplicity about the end user having the ability to see all the resources that they uh, have. So something that you as an admin has dedicated uh, for for them for their usage, and then um, they would have uh, they will be totally autonomous uh, to create their own environment in a isolated manner, just for the tenant. So the project where they are that the admin has configured. First of all, we can see how easy it is to create a virtual machine. This is a portal that we have built. Um, this is our code. And this is really uh, being created to facilitate the consumption of the services that you as an admin are providing to your end customer. It is a wizard, so you have 
first of all, an image that you can uh, select from uh, a menu. Then you have a volume. The boot volume has been created by default. And then it's very easy just to attach any other volume that can be already in the platform or add uh, a new volume here, uh, put in the size of it. And then we have the storage policy here. The storage policy is something pretty important. Um, and I will go through the uh, definition of the storage policy at the admin level later in the admin panel, because we have this panel, which is the end user panel. And then we have also the admin panel where you as an admin can easily manage your cluster. The storage policy is something that is defining the tier that you uh, are allocating and proposing to your customers so that they can select. Because this is just a um, um, default storage policy that I have at the moment, I do not have any others, so I can create my volume here and it's done. When I select the flavor, it's just the size of my VM. So from this list, I'm selecting what I need, and then I have to specify the network interface. This is pretty interesting because it's again, as Paul described before, it's related to the software defined networking that we have. Uh, and this is enabling the user to create one or multiple private networks, depending on the needs. And everything that has been created in this environment is fully isolated, meaning that has been exposed just to this tenant, to this customer in this environment for their VM without having any other impact. And as you can see, it's very easy to create, um, and I will show you also the, the network interface to select which of the private network interface I want my VM to be on. I can, ha I have automatic DHCP with a primary address, a secondary one, and security group, which is important in terms of uh, adding an extra layer of security with a set of firewall rules at the VM level. And then adding this network to this VM and just clicking onto the deploy, we have uh, our virtual machine that has been created and will be active in just a couple of seconds. We have uh, ones that have been created, the ability directly from this panel. So this is, again, something uh, about the simplicity and how the customer can connect to this panel and do most of the uh, action directly from here, from rebooting, shutting down. We have also the console that we can open directly from this console. Um, and then we have many other properties that we can edit and change on the fly without switching out, switching off the uh, the VM. Um, once that when we, I have created all those uh, all this virtual machine, we touch something very important like images. Images is something that as an admin um, you can propose to your uh, end user. And end users can even add their own images. It's something that you can manage. So end users can um, add or not, depending on the settings that you as an admin have uh, configured. We have seen volumes. So we have volumes that are being created that are attached to my uh, VM, but I can also have some volume that are not attached to them at the moment that I can attach at any moment, as well as for other volume created, I can force detach, for example. And whenever I have this kind of volume that I can then reattach, I can clone, I can create images and create snapshot per volume of this. So this is um, really simple way of managing different type of volumes for the customers. Networks, we have seen um, in the slides how we have those virtual private network, everything uh, defined a software level and fully isolated. I can create as many net private network I want and that will be just for the internal usage. I can create a private network 192, for example, for, for my um, primary IPs and then a 10.0 network for the uh, internal usage of my VM. 
And I've, I have also the ability to have the public network. This public network is something that is more the physical network or something that is going outside. So for the internet part. And then we have virtualized virtual router so that we can add um, a virtual router and add a communication between the public and the internal network, choosing the private one that I want have to be routed to the external part to the internet. So in terms also of the other feature that we have, thanks to the ability to create um, different software-defined network layer, we have also the floating IP. The concept of the floating IP is important in terms of providing a public IP to a specific VM or a load balancer. So again, here you can see all the services that the user can immediately consume and add in their own portal and then they can configure on their own. So I can bind one, one of the public IP to a specific VM or a load balancer in my specific environment of the customer. We have also then, as I said, the ability to create load balancers. This is a load balancer a service which is coming out of the box, ready to be used. And the, all those services that I'm showing you here are services that you as an admin can define to um, show to your users, to your customers or not. This is important to understand because um, once that you see all the services that we have, uh, like for example, also VPN as a service to create uh, a VPN as a service side-to-side um, -side connection inside this specific environment. We have also Kubernetes as a service. All those services that you can see here in the end user portal are coming out of the box included in our license. So this means that you can put then a price if you want uh, to have your customers paying for an additional services. But for you, all those services are available and the customers can consume those services uh, whenever they want because they are coming out of the box. And this is one of the nicest things that we have the Kubernetes cluster. So inside the your infrastructure as a service product, you have also the Kubernetes cluster service that you can propose to your customers. Um, it's very easy, even for people uh, that are not used to manage Kubernetes cluster, going and configure this Kubernetes cluster through the wizard is very simple. Then, you have the credential, you have the login to go inside your Kubernetes cluster and the end user consuming the Kubernetes cluster and managing this Kubernetes cluster apart for what was created inside the infrastructure as a service part. So you have the high availability for the master nodes so that free master node can be created. You can select the flavor, so how big those uh, master node will be. Um, you can have the choice of the storage policy where you would like to have uh, the master and worker nodes uh, on which kind of storage. You have the worker group with the auto scaling. So again, here, it's very uh, nice to have this feature included for the auto scaling so that uh, you can increment the number of working when needed. And that's it. This is the end user portal where you can see all the services and consume all the services in an easy manner. Now, I would like to show you the multi-tenancy. This is um, something very important to understand in our product because thanks to the uh, OpenStack orchestration, we have the ability to create virtual data center, right? As uh, Paul described in the slide where we have um, tenants with their own virtual data center. So each of one has in OpenStack terminology is called a domain. So I can create uh, all the domains here and inside the domain, I have the ability to create users. Inside the users, there is this um, domain administrator 
that can create a project, can manage the quotas, can uh, have the ability to upload images. Or I can create just a project member. The project member means that is inside the domain and can manage just a specific project. And this is where I'm defining the project, so the environment for my end user. So this is my environment, the one that I have here. This is how, and at the admin level, I managed it through the quotas, meaning that from the overall cluster resources that you as an admin, you are managing, you are dedicating, so this is completely done by the software part, uh, and assigning a certain amount of memory, CPUs, storage. You can define which storage policy you want this user to set to use, and the services. So I do not want any more, or I don't want at all that they use the Kubernetes or the VPN connection. So I just click onto the save button. And when I come back here, there is um, no more the Kubernetes, there is no more the VPN. So again, for you, it will be something uh, very easy to manage uh, the quotas and all the services that you uh, can provide to your customers. Um, and then we have the monitoring part. So the end user can monitor their, their own environment from this page. And then you have as an admin, the ability to monitor the full cluster from this panel. Uh, we have load of alerts. We have also the ability to use the Grafana dashboard, which is providing you a lot of detailed information about the overall um, functionalities in the, in the cluster and on your nodes. And then we are going into the different part of this uh, admin console where you are managing the full cluster where we can see an overview about all the resources that we have, the nodes. So this is a very small cluster of three nodes. What we normally say is that it will be good to start playing with the product uh, with three nodes, for example, starting a very small environment with three nodes, but it would be good to, to have then five nodes as a production cluster as a minimum. Um, this is important because, because of the storage part. So we have in this case, the storage uh, and the volume associated. So the storage for the compute part, for the VMs, okay? In this part, we have storage policy. We have seen during the creation of the VMs were to have this volume created, the storage policy. The storage policy is very important to uh, that you understand also the way we are working with tiers because uh, we are very flexible. We are pretty um, hardware agnostic and we are very flexible in terms of which kind of disk type you can use in, in the, inside the cluster when you use the virtuoso storage part. Um, and here you are defining the tier so that you can have like uh, SSD tier or uh, NVMe tier, and then the failure domain. This is important to understand because with the failure domain that's normally by default it at host level, we are defining also the folder tolerance. If we think about fixing this failure domain at host level, with our guarantee the VM high availability with this uh, redundancy, so replication. We have redundancy about with replication or erasure coding. If we're talking about replication, like in this example, we have a redundancy of three replicas. It means that whatever it would happen to two of my nodes over the five that I have in production, I have still the three 
replicas, meaning that the data of my VM and the metadata of the VM are written three times so that at least even if I have two nodes down, my VM is up and running and there's absolutely no interruption of the services. If you have two replicas, of course, we need to decrease. So there is just uh, one host that can have a failure. And with that without any kind of redundancy, of course, we need to uh, be careful about that because this means no high availability for the VMs. But just keep in mind that thanks to the way we have implemented our software-defined storage and with the definition of the storage policy, you have the high availability of the VM at the cluster level without any downtime at all. And this is also important when we are talking about um, the update because we have a unique product that is providing you the ability to have uh, this update rolling out node by node so that the node is put in maintenance node as can be updated and then it's another node that would uh, will go uh, in the update mode. Uh, and because we have this ability and high availability inside the cluster, everything will be up and running from the control plane uh, to the older VMs that you have there. And this is how it is managed at the infrastructure level where you have all the services up and running in all the nodes. Now there is also uh, we have also the ability to provide some storage services. This is not the storage for the VM. It's just something that it's uh, nice to have because of the um, software defined storage that we have, where you can define backup storage or use the S3 as a service, as an additional services that you can provide to your customers. In this manner, you can have uh, a different type of storage and nodes maybe with less compute and uh, much more storage that you can uh, dedicate, have dedicated to S3 as, as a service, for example, um, rather than uh, other, it just manage from the same console. And because we, um, have, as we have seen, we have OpenStack compatible. So this means that uh, whenever you are looking for anything that you would like to integrate, uh, just we need to have integrated something that is OpenStack compatible. For example, for the billing and metering services, this is important because um, we know I, that the, the effort in metering uh, and what our platform is doing is that is uh, collecting all the data about the consumption and about the resources used by every customer. And then you just need to use uh, the Nokia API to export and bill your customer for the invoice. And that's it. So it's very powerful. Uh, the platform that is letting you controlling the full cluster from this admin panel where you can have the overview of everything and create also services for your customers in case you need to like create a virtual machine um, or for the network part and so on. And then you can provide a full source service portal to your customer, providing this uh, in total isolation and multi-tenancy. And whenever you do not have the ability in a couple of clicks to um, have your perfect settings or to achieve what you would like to have in terms of the configuration, there's always the ability to have the integration with the OpenStack API, so through the CLI, and also for every other integration with third-party tools, it, it would be very easy because it is natively OpenStack. So I would stop now, conscious of the time, and uh, go back to uh, Paul for the final slides. So um, this is just really just a bit of a summary. 
um, because we shared with you a lot of the theory I was talking about uh, previously. And then Alice showed you the platform in operation, both the self-service UI. So this is how, if you like, consumers actually manage, deploy the workloads together with the administration panel as well, the admin UI. And this is how you configure the system and set up more of the kind of holistic settings across the cluster as well. Um, there's one question, and honestly, I've been trying to scan these questions, but they're coming in thick and fast. So I know there was one question about, can we also integrate with API? Yes, there is full documentation about this. Everything that you've seen, and obviously things that you haven't yet seen in the uh, UI, you can programmatically um, um, use through the API as well. So when we get into questions about well, automation, how can we do this? Can we script? Yeah, absolutely you can. Terraform and Ansible are the standard ones as well. We use Terraform ourselves. Um, so again, what you've just seen, Virtuoso Hybrid Infrastructure, is a true multi-tenancy um, orchestrated platform. I'm going to use the word orchestrated because we use OpenStack to really orchestrate components within this to support the virtual workloads. Simple as that. It's simple when I say it quick, I know. Uh, integration with Prometheus and Grafana as well. And um, yeah, so this is really just a bit of a recap about the different elements therein. Now, the next thing to talk about, well, if I could get my cursor back, the next thing is we've told you about the actual solution, the platform itself, but how can we actually support you um, in this transition? Because we, when we talk with clients, it's about the journey, it's about the whole thing, isn't it? Because we know that for anybody to change what they're doing currently, and let's say with VMware, despite all of the challenges Broadcom are introducing to the market, to all of us, um, you still want to think about, well, what does it mean for me to change and how can I, what is the impact? And we learned a while ago um, with this that uh, it's a whole journey. And um, clients that we work with, they will need a degree of support. And some clients, it's a large amount of support, and others, no, they're very self-sufficient. And there's everything in between as well. We've got a large professional services organization. And within that, we set up, if you like, a, a team of migration specialists, purely because of the um, interest and the demand and so on. So we have a migration team of professional services, um, engineers, and architects, and, and project managers to actually help with this transition. And they can do as much or as little as is needed. So you can see some of the key areas on the right hand side. Um, all engagements tend to be um, a degree of, you know, discovery, analysis and um, planning. And we do that to understand, well, it kind of seems obvious, doesn't it? Well, what are we looking to potentially move from and where to? Every single engagement we have with the client is different. And it could be different hardware, different uh, hypervisor, mixed hypervisor, different application, you know, so on and so forth. So everyone's different. So we spend time understanding what is it you're trying to achieve? What is the best way? Typically, it's with least impact to yourselves in terms of business operation. And these are some of the key drivers for us. Yes, we've got a target platform and we'd love you to use this and migrate over to this. But we know it's not just as simple as saying, yeah, there you go. It's easy. From there, over there, off you go. No, no, no. We want to help you at all these steps. So the first one is discovery, analysis, and planning. And we can also um, get involved, or we do also get involved, with the destination planning, understanding what the target architecture is. Now, if you operating a data center, and you know, let's say hypothetically, you, you know, you're running VMware, you've got, you know, your ten, you know, hosts over there, and then you've also got on the next rack, you know, the ten hosts completely empty, not being used, they're spare, you know, identical hardware, all that kind of thing. That makes our life easier, it certainly does. But the reality is, is that people have different journeys. Organizations have got different requirements and different different types of hardware, perhaps. It might be you're looking to retire some old hardware and secure some new hardware, whatever it might be, it doesn't matter. But we can get involved with as much or as little help and assistance with that. We also, we found this to be really important, um, a POC of the migration itself, if you like, proof of validation, proof of concept, whatever you want to call it, we can also call it a dry run, but it's basically proving the mechanics of how we can actually migrate from one point to another. We use, by the way, a number of tools. Um, the, um, it's a mixture of third-party tools, so you may be familiar with things like um, um, high stacks, 
uh, migration. Um, we use um, Acronis uh, in some uh, cases, but we've also developed a number of tools ourselves. So these are tools, utility scripts that we've built ourselves. And a large reason for us, large push for us doing that is that whole point that every customer environment tends to be a little bit different, a little bit nuanced. So we've got a number of tools and we can basically offer full migration service. We can offer handholding, let us show you the process. You're happy with that, you take over. So that kind of shadow us for the first few, you know, virtual machines that we migrate, you see what we do, then it becomes a repetitive task. You can actually manage that because a lot of these things, they must be coordinated and managed with yourselves at the forefront of that activity, because this is all about your own business operation. Um, coupled with all of this is that uh, last red box at the bottom, we offer um, full, um, basically training services as well. We offer full education. We have our own training department within Virtuoso. And we offer um, uh, well, a whole swathe of online courses that you can take. So these are free of charge, by the way, um, to clients. And you can learn as much or as little <laughs> as you wish with our platforms. As you saw with Leachase Demo, we like to think it's easy to use and it's accessible. And I talked about that at the start as well. We have some clients using our software that haven't done any education, any training, because yeah, they figure it out, they want, yeah, they work with it, everything's fine, it's intuitive, and that is our design thought process behind the system as well. But if you really want to get under the covers, you want to learn a lot more, we have basically stepped learning paths. We can start on the, let's call it 101 level, go to 201, go to 301, however much you want to consume, that's absolutely fine. Lots and lots of documentation, lots of collateral, um, I think there's one question, and literally they're flying on the screen, by the way, and it was about, is there sort of online videos for some of this? Yeah, we've got lots of online videos as well that you can help. You know, you can go over, you can look at very specific functions uh, that we've created um, videos as well. So my point here with all of this, just to bring this together, is that we've got a whole raft of migration services to help migrate from wherever you may be coming from. You know, it might not be VMware. You might have VMware plus something else into Virtuoso. And we can help with that. A lot of time we need that to do that analysis with you. Um, and that is a sensible way forward. Uh, so thank you for joining. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Paul, for great presentation. That was uh, wonderful.